It's the Swole Patrol Podcast. Swole Patrol. Calling all members of the Swole Patrol. It is the Swole Patrol Podcast. Oh, yes, yes. With me, Mike Hathaway, and Dr. Drew Pinsky. Ah, it's fantastic. Welcome to the greatest health and fitness podcast in the world. Not even open for debate. The only podcast that isn't trying to push supplements on you or get you injured. Just the pursuit of health and fitness as a lifestyle. Dr. Drew Pinsky here, board certified physician. Now we got to establish ourselves as yeah. one of the greatest. We, we're declaring it. Today. No, it's it's been well it's been established. Declared. Yeah, uh, Mike Catherwood has been on my ass for what's today? Today's like about four years to do this yeah. podcast, and now here we are. We're finally well, doing it. Every second that we're not doing something for money, you and I are talking about lifting weights and, and diet. Or yeah, you're sending me horrible texts and talking. About or I'm it. sending you uh, inside out asshole. It's one of the two. It's it, Dr. And, and Drew. You, well, yeah, and you're showing me hot women too. You, you send me those texts. You mix those. That's in. That's a good point, Dr. It's just Drew. Just his weird reinforcing. Let me, reinforces the the rat, so he keeps coming around. Doesn't, doesn't fully jump out of the cage. Let me give you a good rundown, percentage wise, of what Dr. Drew and I do in our free time. Twenty five percent inside out asshole. Sixteen percent. Sixteen percent Victoria's Secret model. And then the rest, I'm, I'm, it's all the rest you know, lifting fitness. weights and diet. Yeah. Introduce our guest, speaking of that. He is the man who is known probably best for his documentary film, Bigger, Stronger, Faster, but also a filmmaker who has made excellent, excellent documentaries in the world of athletics and fitness, including Prescription Thugs. Uh, what's the one about parents? Trophy Kids. Trophy Kids. That's yeah. a great one as well. I'm talking about Chris Borbell at Big Strong Fast on Twitter and Instagram. How are you, my friend? Good. How are you guys doing? I saw a, I turned out a doc, uh, an Ardle documentary this week, and I, I don't know who did it, but I thought of you when I watched it. Which? Uh, it was super, a new, super, It's on Netflix. Not like super Born super, Strong. Born Strong. Oh, Born, Born Strong. So Born Strong, yeah, that's about the uh, world's strongest yeah, man. Yeah, that wasn't you, though, huh? It wasn't me. Actually, it it actually was me. That yeah. was my idea. I figured. And that production company, I should actually sue them because okay. <laughs> they took my idea and said, this is a great idea, and they went and did it on their own. Yeah. Uh, I have a lot of documentation of that. But anyway, that was a, that's a subject matter that I'm really interested in, the world's strongest man um, competitor. So I, I actually enjoyed the documentary. I think you could break it down and, and follow each one of those guys and do a whole series. I, I think we're actually going to do that. Yeah. So my brother, his company Slingshot, sponsors Brian Shaw, who is uh, the four-time world's strongest man. He's the big tall He's dude. the American, the American of the group. Yeah, he's 6'8", yeah. 420, and I yeah. think we're going to follow him he's uh, this year as he goes to get his fifth title. So we're going to And, and then I liked, I liked in that documentary particularly, after you, you, you struggle with these guys all the way through the Arnold event, then you realize, oh, my God, they open up. There's a whole other world. There's other worlds of this out there that oh, yeah. I'm interested in. I thought, hmm, Well, they have to become had... the Lithuanian champion, and, the European and, champion. Well, and the... then there's the, the this lift and the that lift and the, all these different Yeah, kinds there's all of... sorts of specialty yeah. lifts. Right, you know, right. Within the it, throwing a... the willy over the <laughs> – For example, uh, Eddie Hall, he deadlifted 1,102 pounds. And, so um, do I. Yeah, and that that was just crazy to watch, you know, to yep. see ten thousand people in England. Like you never th- see ten thousand people for a lifting event, but uh, now lifting has become more popular. I think the CrossFit movement uh, was a big part of that. Yeah. Making, CrossFit, yeah, well, I do. I think that CrossFit has been the biggest blessing and curse to the fitness world uh, as a whole, probably ever. And let me tell you why. One, it's gotten it's gotten guys who are already kind of interested, and I do say guys, I mean specifically men. Guys who are already interested in health and fitness, it's turned them into complete assholes. Why? Uh, because of the whole kind of CrossFit world is very cult-like and Grow shit a beard and get a man bun. And they, they wear stupid <laughs> clothes and they wear stupid bandages. <laughs> and Web and, shoes yeah, and stuff. Yeah. And web Cape. shoes and all that paleo nonsense caveman, you know, shithead, shitheadery. There's a lot of stuff to not like about it. But – it's but. gotten the guy who isn't necessarily like the average kind of just day trader who just <laughs> normally would have just gone for 30 minutes on the treadmill and watched Sports Center and joined a gym and then stopped going after March. It's gotten that guy to actually lift weights, like lift oh. re- legitimate, do deadlifts, do women. See, I, I always yeah. thought his CrossFit is, is resistant but not weightlifting. So no, I, it's, I was, it, you it know, has women, like it got women lifting weights, I think, a lot. That and is women true. women. Really interested in a sport of powerlifting, and to me, that's really so important. So, CrossFit because, is fueled powerlifting interest. That's yeah, so to me. when I was growing up, and especially would, Olympic lifting. Uh, I mean, it's gotten Americans who are t- traditionally at the bottom of the barrel when it comes to Olympic lifting. Um, even though we're athletically probably the greatest in the world, Olympic lifting has been something that Americans have never been dominant at. Now, with cro- through CrossFit alone, 
Americans have an interest in Olympic lifting, the snatch and, and I the I love that injury. Lithuanian From guy. the a- <laughs> Zagueda or whatever. Oh, Zagueda. Zagreda's the biggest. Z- yeah, he's great. <laughs> Zagreda's. From, you know, from the ages of 17 until I was about 30 years old, I competed as a power lifter at a really high level and never really saw too many women at any of the meets. Yeah, yeah. You know, I was always thinking, like, as a young guy, as a teenager, like, well, when I can bench 500, chicks will be flocking to me. And I bench 500 and nobody cares. You know what I mean? <laughs> and it was just like, yeah, it probably didn't le- stop less you, I think nowadays people, people would care a little bit more, but yeah. still they don't really care that much right. how much you lift. It's like what you look like and what your diet is and, you know, the things like that. Well, that, I, that's, I, I'm, I'm really psyched we're doing this today because two two things I want to get into. One is and I'm going to table it for a second, but I'll just introduce it now, is that I realized after the uh, Trump physician press conference yeah. how c- effing confused people are about fitness versus sure. trying to optimize health versus medically well. Right. There's huge confusion okay. about Basically, that. Did I want say to break- he only weighed 242? It, it doesn't matter what he weighs. It doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. He's healthier than me. And I'll explain what I mean by that. Uh, that's explain, interesting. Okay. Yeah. He, from a medical perspective, okay. his doctor was 1,000% spot on. And he's in much better shape medically than I am. Why is that? Yet, look at me. I, do I look no. more... No, you look like... I you, look, look, you look amazing, actually. Yeah, but for a man of your age... In. Yeah, so I should know, be... Dr. Th- Drew, 88, 88 years old. <laughs> um, no, but for a man of your age, you're a, the picture of health right. in many people. Externally. Yes. You're, that's, uh, for fitness, I am. And I'm using fitness to sort of... Have, perhaps have an impact on my medical issues, but it's nominal. It's a separate phenomenon. It's a sure. separate issue. But we'll talk about that. But you mentioned diet. Yeah, I was curious what uh, what you guys thought about that guy that was on. Was it Rogan that? Paleo, you said paleo. Yeah, he's a doctor, a yeah. physician who eats nothing but meat. I it's just interviewed him for I three f- hours. I figured. What, yeah. So that, my brother a- and I are doing a documentary about nutrition. And, oh, um, that'll be awesome. We interviewed Dr. Sean Baker for three hours. He's the guy that the eats like day. 12 pounds of meat. Now, wait, yeah, right. now, hold on. It's important for the audience who are maybe isn't familiar with Chris or isn't that familiar with the world of powerlifting and strength training. Your brother, a, a very important figure in the world of powerlifting and, and, and kind of social media and how it applies to um, strength training. Uh, your brother Mark, Mark Smelly Bell, he's he's a celebrity. In <laughs> yeah, our, pretty I mean, much. Yeah. yeah, he's got a huge following and yeah. everything. But you know, um, I can go back on this like twenty plus years. When I first moved to California, uh, I was a power lifter. I went to Gold's Gym in Venice, and I was training with a guy, Mike O'Hearn, who's really pretty popular in the bodybuilding Mike, yeah. community. He, he always on, claimed he was not taking supplements. Claims he's right? natural. Yeah, yeah. Mike O'Hearn. Was Trent. he? Mike O'Trent? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so yeah, um, yeah, yeah he's good. very natural. <laughs> Moving on. No, I, I love- he's, he's like fifty now and he shredded looks- and 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 dense two forty. His brother muscle. was the same way, right? He had the brother he was has like a brother. exactly the same. He has a, a brother who's a lot smaller than him, actually. Okay. But he's, you know, he's in great shape. And when I first got to uh, California, I wanted to Mike be like these guys. <laughs> but I was actually pretty close to him in strength, but not anywhere near you know, the way he looks or anything like that. Well, when I first got here, I was 240 pounds and him and his training partner said, well, you're too fat. You gotta, you gotta go on a diet. You know, basically it was pretty blatant, pretty, mm-hmm. <laughs> pretty obvious. What are we talking? 96, 94. Okay. And so I said, well, what kind of diet, you know, do I go on? And he tells me to go get a piece of paper, get ready to write down. And, um, it wasn't Michael Hearn. It was our training partner, Ron Fedko, who was a PhD in applied mathematics and physics, uh, who told me, okay, get ready, write this down. And he told me red meat and water. And so I wrote that down. And I was waiting for the rest of it. And <laughs> it it, it was red meat and water, right? So yeah. now, now let's, let's slow down. Now, is that the diet for a power lifter, for somebody who wants to bodybuild? This and, was a and diet up for a, bit, a guy. Or for all human beings? This was a diet for a guy who was overweight. And wanted to compete in a lower weight class, Com- and still, so, but it's a sports recommendation. It's sports recommendation. Yeah, it's still not, it's wanted not to, a, yet a health recommendation. Sure, still wanted to. Well, it's going to turn into that. I'll get into that, and and still wanted to be strong. Yeah. Like, and so, how do I be strong without eating any carbs? And he's like, "You're just going to eat red." No meat. eggs, huh? No, he yeah. just said you're going to eat red meat. So I yeah. did it. At the time, I was just naive, so I just did it so religiously for about three weeks. I got down to 218 pounds. From what? I, from 240? From 240. In, in, in how long? three weeks? About three weeks. That's crazy. I won my weight class. Wow. At, um, you know, under, in a 220 weight class. Now, wait a second. Did you carb up any, uh, uh, at yeah. all before the competition? Or? Before the competition, I did, but okay. here's why I... I would I, argue way more is made of that than yeah. need be, but go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I would argue the yeah. same the same thing, yeah. what, what I know now. Yeah. Um, so basically, yeah, I carved up before the competition, and I, I won that competition. 
And I realized like, oh, maybe we don't need so many carbs. That's what I was – I was living on pasta. Yeah. So for a while That's I did a – pasta was the answer. I, yeah, I did a ketogenic diet for a while back then, and I kept my weight you know, pretty low and sustainable. But as the years went along and I was doing other things and working on films, and we've talked about this in the past, I had a double hip replacement surgery, which uh, I shouldn't say turned me. I turned into a drug addict because of that. Um, I was – every time I said my hip hurts, I was just given more pills. And for two years, they didn't know that they botched the surgery and would have to redo it. And, and, oh. let, me, and I'll, let me just – if you don't mind me interjecting ahead, these ahead. stories. Um, since we last spoke, it's become increasingly clear, and you and I have talked about this, Mike, that there is a new category of addicted, which is yeah. not drug addict addicted. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Well, I, I listen if, to I, Chris, I want to clarify that, but you can go ahead, Mike. I listen like to it. Chris say the word, and, and for those who don't know, I'm a drug addict. I'm in recovery. Uh, I I refuse to hear the words I was turned into a drug addict unless you're talking about opioids. Yeah, which I now know through just from anecdotal experience and then from seeing it through your eyes, Drew, yeah. as a physician. Something specific about opioid-based painkillers. Yeah, they can turn you into an at I, least I, I dependent call, call, to the point. That's that right. You're, I call it a, a, a dependent, not addicted addict. Right. In other words, when sure. you stop, you could probably stop. Mike, no stopping. For what? Without, without him treatment. Yeah. So, so it's really about stopping the opiates with the the d- dependent addict, when strictly I, dependent. Addict. And when I look at someone like myself, who my drug of choice was stimulants and alcohol, you're not you're not going to become a daily morning drinker unless that's in your blood. Yeah. Right, okay. Your genetics, that yeah. doesn't. That you don't just stumble upon yeah, that right. lifestyle. <laughs> you don't just start learning how to cook crack and yeah. buying your <laughs> and like become this. Sommelier of cocaine. Uh, it's that, a thing. That is in your. That is in. That was in my blood. Yeah. Um. Someone could easily get a hip replacement like Chris oh, all the time, and then next thing I know, their out. life is spi- all spiraling the out of control. All the time yeah, I'm not sure where I really fall in that because I did become the morning drinker. Mm-hmm. You know, I did become. Was that uh, your Was that your way of trying to deal with the opiates? Well, I got off of opioids oh, first, yeah. and then I switched right okay. to alcohol. All right. all right. So maybe you're yeah. so I, I, I'm not really maybe sure. old fashioned. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um. So anyway, where, where but I, I, there's another subcategory. I, I, I sort of break these all down in my head. There's another subcategory of, of opiate-induced addict. Maybe that's yeah. In other words, he wouldn't have been an addict had he not got exposed to the opiate. But once that switch was thrown by the opiates, it changes the Well, Chris, it is that. in your blood, though. I mean, you, you had another it's brother. It's in my family, my right. older brother. Well, clearly, if you have the but real deal, you have the really real deal. there was a really distinct so. difference between my older brother, Mike, a.k.a. Mad Dog, and myself, where, um, you know, I remember just my dad saying, for example, um, my dad's like, hey, I heard if a dog sticks his head out the window, they get high. But that can't be true because if it was true, your brother would have his head out the window all the time. <laughs> and he, and he, really, he, really meant, he really meant that. Yeah, yeah, you know? I get it. And he said that's the difference between you and Mike is yeah. where like Mike, he cannot stop no matter what we do. Right. So he has a big – what we call a big biological burden. Yours and was lesser but still induced. It was definitely lesser. So triggered yeah. by opiates. And, and I could definitely um, feel for my brother in the fact that he always had to have – you know, he was always – He's like, more like Mike. You're relying on, some, yeah, more like Mike. on something. And yeah. so, but, you know, for, for me, um, actually, so I did good with that diet a long time ago. I got into the drugs. I got up to like 260 pounds. And one year ago, it's almost like a year to the date, um, I was sitting with my brother. We were eating. I was about uh, 230 pounds. And I just said to him, you know, I'm, I'm too fat. I'm sick of this. I don't like the way I feel. I don't think I'm going to live very long. Like, I, I don't feel good. And then um, actually a month before that, on election day, I was walking to the polls with my girlfriend at the time, and I thought I was having a heart attack. I yeah. couldn't I couldn't breathe. You know, Great. I'm, I'm 44 years old at the yeah, time. That's crazy. And I couldn't breathe. And it was hot out and everything, but, like, I'm just like, I'm too short to be this fat. You know, like, Were you taking any supplements or steroids or anything? I wasn't, I wasn't on anything. And so um, what I did was went home and just said, how do I stop inflammation? How do I beat, you know, how do I beat this thing that's beating me down? But I remember, like, it was yesterday sitting with my brother, and, and I said, I'm going to launch a war on carbs. And I was just kidding around. I'm like, I know carbs for me. For me, personally, that's what does it. Mm. And I said, war on carbs, and we toasted a piece of sh- sashimi together. And from that day on, for 45 days, I didn't eat carbs. Yeah. And I lost, like, 50 pounds. Yeah. You know, and people think it's crazy. They think it's so wild. But there aren't really, you know, you know this, there's not really essential carbohydrates that we need to have nope. every day. That's nope. that's something that's made up by the, the food industry to make us consume a lot of foods that are really bad for us. You know, so I embarked on a ketogenic diet, lost a lot of weight, and now I've been sort of trumpeting that for a lot of other people. 
and um, this documentary that we're embarking on and, and talking about sort of starts with a ketogenic diet as the basis and then examines like, is this the right way to eat? Is yeah. there something more to it? And we're just trying to figure out the truths so we can tell people some common truths so that, like you said, they're not so confused. The, there, and I, I, I would argue there aren't all truths for all people. Sure. We're, we are genetically very different. It's very individual. And, and also yeah. folded into the story about protein is fat. Mm-hmm. That story, which has been it gets it gets controversy, and I still don't know quite what to do with it. Yeah, I, I'm I'm a fat uh, apologist, I'd say, right? Which means what? Which you, means you I I just I I know I justify the taking of fats. I, I think it's probably appropriate. I'm sort of Vinny Tortorich, and yeah. you know, and I, and I think it helps control diet. Yeah. Now, on the other hand. I have large vessel vascular disease in my family, and if I were not on medication, this is back to the fitness talk for later, uh, I would have very, very serious concerns about that. When, so it depends on, this, again, the, on the setting person. and the person. Sure. Yeah. As you're both pointing out, you know, someone like Chris who's, who's been through it himself and, and kind of used himself as a lab rat, and then someone like you, Drew, who sees it from a scientific standpoint. I always come back to the same argument that I make. It is that the same problem with diet and nutrition advice is the same problem with like the Me Too movement or – modern civil rights movement is that they try to create this black and white idea of something that's incredibly individualized. Uh, Diet is uh, unbelievably individualized down to the human being and you can't make these broad claims like, well, the ketogenic diet is the best way to go. The vegan diet is the best way to go. Uh, I I recall um, in my bodybuilding days, a guy I used to train with and he was 5'10", exactly my size. He was a little bit naturally leaner than I was, but he... Were you both doing... Yeah, Juice. tons of steroids, tons, tons of steroids. steroids yeah. But um, I was three weeks out preparing to go on stage, and I could not eat over forty grams of carbs, or I would put on, you know, I would bloat. Wrong kind of weight. I would bloat, and I would kind of get out of line with my goals. He was eating four or five hundred, yeah, and shredded to the bone, and that was just his. You know, then he again, was able I'm, to take right. that in. That and was adapt his body. That was I. I would eat one hundred and fifty, two hundred grams of 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 fat. He couldn't eat more than fifty. He would get, you know, it's something. There's weird. Well, there's the some genetic that, testing for this now. Yeah. There's some people sort of building genetic models around this. Sure, there's sure. a great book out. Anybody interested in reading about nutrition that Rob Wolf put out called Wired to Eat. Mm-hmm. It's a pretty new book. And in that book, he discusses um, testing out carbohydrates using a glucose meter, which might be a little too far for some people, but for people like us, we do that kind of thing. And he breaks out the glucose meter and he checks his blood glucose a half an hour after he eats certain foods. So he knows like what he can eat and what he can't eat. If the reading's too high, he'll put that on like, I that can't could be the future. eat that That could list. be the future. And it's, it's interesting. It's really interesting because yeah, – Because now we're going to have it you know, available on our wrists and things. You'll be able to wear a we know you could just cut, like we, we know you can just cut the carbs out and get – the same get a similar result but like why cut them out if they're there and we can utilize them and we can utilize them for a good quick energy and be faster bigger faster stronger right, right? why why not do those things so i think looking at it in that way is an interesting way also well. it, 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 people have different emotional reactions to drop i mean i'm fine i drop carbs i feel fine some people talk about that quote unquote that keto flu yeah. They get crippled. I have heroin it. withdrawal. Yeah. I, I have opiate <laughs> withdrawal from when I stop carbs. Yeah. Full on opiate withdrawal. <laughs> really? Desperation, irritability, preoccupations, uh, you know, depression, sleep disturbance. Full opiate withdrawal. I think that the, you know, that's. I mean, aren't carbs yes. similar? To yes. A, well, to, they, uh, they what they do, what drugs similar. do. Similar. Well, certain people, clearly me, other people I know, like him, t- cuts out carbs. Eh, yeah, it just whatever. doesn't bother me. Whatever. Yeah. yeah. There For was me, an interesting heroin. argument, and maybe you can actually add to this a lot further. So I was talking to somebody, actually Rob Wolf, the guy who wrote the book. I was speaking with him, and he was like, well, "We know the Godfather that, of the Paleo kind of diet." Yeah. Thing, yeah. Rob Rob's pretty much the king of the Paleo world. But I was saying to him, like, "Well, you know, like sugar's addictive." And he goes, well, you got to be careful there. Like, yeah, people that, aren't knocking over liquor stores yeah, no, no, to get it, it, their it sugar. Is, right. Uh, to use the addiction model too broadly is a mistake. Okay. And, yeah. and so, so that's there, good there to There is, Yeah. There, <laughs> there are certain people that have profound, profoundly different motivational states from carbohydrates than, say, other people. Sure. I'm definitely one of them. Tough on right. women, usually, typically. It's typically, that's true. Almost, uh, always true. I'll give you an example. Like, um, for, you know, there's behaviors in my family, you know, um, that are, you know, very like they, they seem addictive to me. Like uh, when we were younger, my mom was very big on hiding candy. 
mm-hmm. you know, like so we, we didn't find it and we didn't get into it. But, you know, and I think that that's sort of a behavior that's Absolutely. like very yeah. much like a yeah, drug yeah. addict, but yeah, yeah. not a drug addict, but like very it's, similar. It's similar. It's very similar. Similar it's, it's issues. In the same and, system, same issue for certain people. But let's go back to the, the physician you were talking to that ate all the meat. We didn't mm-hmm. finish yeah, that conversation. Sure. What did you learn from talking to him? So what I learned from talking to him really is if you were to strip your diet down to like nothing. Uh, the only other way to really do that is fasting, right? We know that uh, red meat contains pretty much every nutrient that we need in order to sustain life. You could sustain life on red meat. The only thing that it's really low in is vitamin C. However, <laughs> an interesting thing, if you're not eating carbohydrates and You don't glucose, need so much. You don't need so much yeah. vitamin C. Yeah. So we know we can sustain life. That on, was his big observation, right? This yeah, guy. yeah. On, on red meat. Um, I've... I've actually been doing it for the past three weeks. So I started January 1st on this, what they call carnivore diet. And I can't find anything to complain about it except for maybe uh, maybe once in a while I want something different you know, to eat. What's the shit situation like? Um, there, there really is none. There, there's, uh, you, you poop. Why, why, what do you think would happen with that? Why, because as a, from a lay person's point of view, I think no fiber, shit problems. Oh, there's yeah. Plenty, but plenty, fi- of, plenty, plenty of I bulk also think, in the meat. Yeah, I think stuff. fiber is also something that's uh, overstated. Yeah. You know, like fiber comes from the useless, you know, holes of corn stalks and things like that that we don't need in the first place. Right. So why do, why do we need that? Well, because the RDA is telling us, USDA is right. telling us, like, we need this because the Department of Agriculture has nowhere to dump all that psyllium husk, right? So they got to dump it somewhere. Why not inside of us, right? I also That's think, the way I look at it. Well, I, I look I, at I, it from a fair. dummy's point of view, and I think to myself, I eat a bunless double-double, and I don't fart, and I don't have stomach upset. If I eat something highly fibrous... That's the only thing that gets me broccoli to, to shit to to just constantly fart and to have that feeling where I'm but not if like I'm not that? actively farting I'm going to fart soon. Do you and, like that? No, and I and oh, I yeah. assume <laughs> well, I like the smell, but uh, uh, but I don't like I don't like to feel that way because I just intuitively go to my think to myself. Well, this is my body saying this is inappropriate. The, the, for me. The, now we're bleeding into a topic which we, we, you and I probably ought to do a future episode because it's or several episodes because it's so complicated. Which is the differences amongst our different gut systems, gut microbiomes, gut microbiomes, gut muscular systems. I, I'm somebody that needs. A, I'm way better with a lot of bulk, way better. Yeah, and actually, almost the more the better. Is and that then, from from a Appetite so control, green leaf, you know, a little bit of appetite and, and a little bit of uh, irritable bowel. A little Let me bit. ask and you a, a weird, and a weird. Some I have some sort of microbiome that's sort of not great. You some, look, some, you some. look awesome. I just wanted to tell you that Thank first you. of all. Second of all, what do you, how do you eat? Uh, I eat a lot of eggs. I eat eggs in the morning. Mm-hmm. Uh, I eat some bread. I try to eat sourdough breads. Lots of jizz. Uh, Why sourdough I, bread? Uh, just because somebody convinced me that at one time. I like it now. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, and I generally, I, I'm, I, I did one of these genetic profiles, and it it confirmed everything I already knew about myself. Everything. And so I'm somebody that can go long periods of time without eating. It, it does not bother me. But once I start, I cannot stop. So I so I tend to you and I uh, both other than having maybe an egg or two in the morning that's my day until dinner time wow and, and then I'll eat so know, kind of a lot of it. fasting almost like almost intermittent, intermittent, fasting. intermittent. I'm intermittent fasting and, yeah. and if, if I eat all the time I'm constantly storing material yeah I if I eat regularly I it hap- it stays on period and you gain weight end of story you gain no matter what I'm eating I'm very, even if I'm eating string beans I'm very I will, I will use it when I start I can't stop yeah. Yeah. and that's just something that I've, just, I've just noticed reality. for myself yeah. have so. you been fasting during this carnivore uh, you know what? Never. <laughs> Carnivore is great. I woke up the other day at like six o'clock in the morning and made two hamburger patties. Yeah, like big. You know, and that's just something yeah. that you don't normally do. You know? <laughs> um, got up in the morning, cooked up a steak. So no, I haven't really been intermittent fasting. I, I've been eating when I'm hungry. Right. He, and um, he didn't. He doesn't advocate that. The, the, what's the doctor? Sean. Sean, Sean Baker. Yeah. yeah doctor Baker. He, he eats. You know, he, he eats like twelve pounds of meat a day. Well, right. He said something. And really, he said he expanded it as it gone on and didn't gain any weight. He said something really interesting to me that I thought was like funny. It doesn't prove anything really but he's like hey look at all the uh vegetable eating animals out there they're all fat like hippopotamus and this you know like it's fat and humans but, but look at carnivores they're all ripped and i'm like you know what you're you're kind of right there you well, got, i don't know if that's you, but you got they, me on may that. or may not be an association, well, I was saying, association. You, you know you got me on that one interesting but, I, I i do not i'm not one of these guys who has like a like a an anti vegan take or i don't have a bone to pick with the vegan movement no neither i do think I. that if you eat vegan for the purposes of for, for for moral reasons it's beautiful and the idea of uh, showing compassion and care for animals is a beautiful thing that i totally support. mike and i are going to hunt for our food yeah. but we're going to go hunt but i do think <laughs> that 
you always find like like guys like Mike Mahler, guys like uh, guys like the Diaz brothers or, or Mac Danzig in the UFC. When there is a vegan who is buff and looks good, you always hold that up as a there this, this prize yeah. trophy. Sure. In reality, that's not very common. Most people who are vegan are softer. Are they? and I, I just that wonder if that's appropriate for the human system. If if that's the case, like generally lean muscular uh, humans. Are eating a a carnivore style diet. Same with the animal kingdom. Well, this and is now sort of bleeding over towards this fitness versus medically well kind of conversation. Yeah, you guys because, go into that because I'm well, going to pee in my pants. No, oh, <laughs> I want you in on this one. I'll, I'll, I'll listen. He, he's listening. Uh, we'll take a little break. Be right back. Well, Mike pees his pants. There you go. Oh, <laughs> this is everything I ever dreamed of. <laughs> we are back. You've urinated. Good. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so we were while you were away, we were getting geeking out on low. Low rep, high high volume, uh, low volume, lifting. high intensity. Yeah. No, no, no. Lo, lo, Some you're, power yeah. lifting stuff. Yeah. yeah. Saying and that the, it's fun to do like low reps, like just have to go in and bang out like three. Anything over five reps is cardio. I, I well, I'm aversive. I, feel, I literally yeah. feel bad. I break down uh, above twelve reps. Yeah. I, I and, and I feel bad, and I hate doing it. And at eight reps, I love doing it, and well, I feel great, and I, and I get something out of it. But then, but the, uh, you know, you're talking about. But that's my genetics. A different, but also not only your genetics, a different, uh, a different outcome. I mean, if you're going to train for purely for hypertrophy, I would imagine, you know, Chris, tell me your thoughts on it. That's something you're going to have to get into. You have to get into those rep ranges yeah. that are just pure, you know, the lactic acid buildup, and 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 you're going to have to feel that discomfort if you're if you like I said, if I you, break down about twelve. Well, that's fine, but you're 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 perfectly fine within that rep range to maintain or to achieve the goal you want to achieve. Yeah. If Dr. Drew wanted to put on thirty pounds of muscle. I'm going to think you're going to have to get into that 12 to 15. I rep don't rate. think so. I think that I think, I it, think the so. science changes so often yeah. that, like in my mind, what I do, I vary it so much mm. that um, you know, I'll do sets of three, but I'll do other things for sets of 20. Yeah, just because I don't, I don't know that there's anybody that really knows for a fact. Yeah, you know. So I, I, just, I agree with you I just, wholeheartedly. I just switch you have it to, up. You a almost lot. have to find your own way. I agree with body. that completely. And I and I and I gauge. I mean, if I were doing what steroids, is anabolic? You're right. If I were doing steroids, 100. percent Yeah. But based on my genetic innate biology, mm-mm. I don't and think I think I get more out of it than. I feel, have I you feel ever like what with is testosterone or anything like that. I would love to. He had I, prostate I, 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 cancer. I prostate cancer. This is, we're going to get into more about my medical oh, stuff. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And I also definitely want to focus in a lot about about anabolics and anabolics. And I like the way cancer. Mike said that to him. He has prostate cancer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> He's like he can't. What a, what a he bitch. Can't, <laughs> yeah, he can't do it. <laughs> do you know a robot ripped his asshole out? <laughs> we'll get into that. Well, hey. <laughs> hey. Um, hey. Now. Listen, I I do think though. You pointed out you got to do what's best for you. I do like look back at myself and I think what is giving me in my in my perceived idea of the most anabolic effect. I know that, like you said, if I'm going to deadlift, it's three reps. If I'm going to squat, I'll go to twenty. I'll go to thirty because something about high rep squatting for me the whole day. I'm an animal. I eat. I could. F- I feel tighter. My skin feels tighter. I feel stronger. Opposite. Opposite. And I and I I feel like I could eat all day. I get unhungry and I'm tired. Yeah, that sounds terrible. Isn't that weird. And we're all different. different. You know? Hey, speaking of, I had some good news on the on the testosterone front. Yeah, there was some data. A great study just came out on men who are, I think they were castration resistant prostate cancer with metastatic disease. They were doing bipolar testosterone. They were hitting them with high levels of testosterone. Fuck yeah! And it seemed like it was turning the genes on in these tumors in such a way that they became better targets for chemotherapy. And so nice. now they're saying, oh. rather than and- androgen depletion, it's this bipolar Go androgen pulsing. I'm like, oh. So wait, before <laughs> chemo, do they get super swole from all the... I don't know. I'll, I'll, that's, that's crazy. Yeah, right? Imagine you put them in like Bane, and then they <laughs> chemo, <laughs> and there a definite, them. a definite 100% link between testosterone and prostate cancer? No, absolutely not. And, and, but once you have it... Then it gets kind of scary. Then it's like mm, whatever. Yeah, but you don't okay, want to mess with it. It's you, like, you could. It definitely grows. It definitely grows under the influence of testosterone. And if I've got something hidden somewhere, I'd rather stay hidden. Right. You know, I don't want to Let me ask you to, another uh, yeah. medical question because yeah. it seems like so many people are on these. So statin drugs. Yeah. They take away. They lower your cholesterol, right? Yeah. And your testosterone is made out of cholesterol. Yeah. Is that killing your cholesterol? Your testosterone it, levels. It. it I, I, I'm on a statin too. This will back into my <laughs> sure. medical stuff. Um, I felt like that was happening, and I felt like I sort of somehow went back towards a more mid range with it. Mm-hmm. And it immediately occurred to me that could be a possibility, though no one's ever documented that. 
but I've had so many other things affecting my testosterone levels, like having surgeries and t- oh, shit. I mean, going through. Um, but I do have a sense that I bet you there's a little something there. Why not? I mean, why wouldn't it be? Yeah. It, it, the, the equation then is how low can you get your cholesterol levels before that starts to be an issue? And if you really need to take a statin, like I do, because I have horrible genetics with, around vascular disease. Uh, what should my goal be without affecting that testosterone sure. level? And and no one knows. It. No is one knows it, it is it rare to have what you have? Like is what you have? Uh, what I what I have because yes. it seems like an awful lot of people are on statins. Yeah, seem well, like it's statins. Very... As as all my cardiac surgeons and friends tell me, they're like, ever since statins came around, they don't do surgery anymore. It just absolutely revolutionized heart disease. It just absolutely just. So that's a good thing. Yeah, it just it just put it away. It just wow. it, it significantly significantly affected. And I can tell See, you that's interesting because yeah. I hear I hear you know on the flip side that they're overprescribed and like they they there's concern that there's overprescribed because there has been so much positive effect that we all get very enthusiastic about it. I can tell you for sure in my situation, my dad had large vessel vascular disease. This is mm-hmm. something. See, there's, there's sort of four different kinds of vascular disease generally. There's peripheral vascular disease, like way out in your legs, you get that from smoking. Mm-hmm. There's coronary artery disease, which is what we all are aware of. There's intracranial cerebral vascular disease. In your brain? And extracranial cerebral vascular disease. Wow. You can get small vessel or large vessel va- cerebral vascular disease. <gasps> and then there's large vessel vascular disease, which is the aorta. What the fuck? We're and, done. And We're so, all dead. so in my genetics, uh, we have large vessel vascular disease and latent life coronary disease. And so I thought, well, I got and I And I did everything I could to bring that cholesterol down. Be- trust me. <laughs> everything. Where and is it at? 300? Right. No, no, it wasn't that bad. So my LDL was like 40. HDL, rather, was like 40. LDL, 120, no matter what I did. Like, it was a bad mix. Mm -hmm. And so I, the whole time, like, shit, I got to do something. And finally, a physician, and and I was a little hypertensive. And the whole, I'm leaning and dieting and running. Finally, a doctor looked at me and goes, you can only outrun your genetics so long, Dr. Pinsky. I'm like, God damn it, she's absolutely right. I'm 50-something years old. I've got horrible genes. It took out everyone else in my family. I don't want to be one of those people. I immediately went on antihypertensives and statins. And uh, then got a calcium score like five years later, zero point zero, which which zero for, point yeah zero point zero, and so everyone in my medical world was like, that's crazy given your genetics because they knew my dad too, and I was like, yeah, that is crazy. So I I am a so pharmacology for me did way more than fitness, right? That's I'm trying to fight genes back now. I'm also interested in fitness. I want to be fit. I feel better fit. I look better fit. It probably is helping me. It's certainly not hurting me to be fit, but it really doesn't change my medical status. I'm a cancer patient. I've got vascular, I've got hypertension, I have hypercholesterolemia. I'm way worse off medically than Donald Trump. And that's what you meant before. That's what I was talking about. And yet you look at the two, put us side by side in right. a bathing suit, and you're going to go, well, that's the healthy guy. You're going to point How much saying- of that is Trump uh, genetics, though? Maybe all, just, all, yeah. all my shit is genetics. Of course, right. it's all so genetics. maybe the Everything Trump family has these great internal yeah, genetics. Clearly. Yeah, clearly, and he can tolerate eating shitty foods and being overweight. And, yeah. But he has he does not have any vascular disease. His his but he's on a statin too, and his calcium score was not zero point zero. It was about ninety. How much does he bench though? I know, I know. Ask him. Ask him. Five fifty. Yeah, but you know, yeah. <laughs> I bench five fifty. Was excellent. You should but, all bench. But the three of us. Put great value in that. Like, well, yeah. who cares? As long as you can. Feel, yeah, but if still you found strong. out that Trump benched like four hundred five, you'd be pretty impressed. There's, Fuck yeah, I would. Like, you'd be I wouldn't like, believe it. There's no I, way. There's I, no way. No, I wouldn't believe yeah. it either. Yeah. But if I found that no, out, no. Like, that's it'd be impressive. I heard, I, I heard Obama did two hundred, just flat two hundred. I was like, hmm. okay. Well, he's in worse Obama's shape in, than Donald Trump because of his smoking. Right. Yeah. That's a far more serious issue than obesity. Now, people want to make the case that it's not. It is smoking. I live through the years. Smoking, people still smoke. smoking. People do oh, like to get terrible. crazy about it. Yeah, and alcohol not good. Trump doesn't drink. I have drink once in a while. So medically, I like that you said I live through the years when people were smoking because it's not really a thing anymore. You right? should have seen the years I Dude, lived. Dude, yeah, I would, you, you and I both live in Venice. So you can yeah. empathize. I was on my street. This is probably like a year ago, and I saw a kid, maybe nineteen years old, skateboarding towards me, and he, as he he was smoking something. As he got closer to me, I saw that he was smoking a cigarette, and I was shocked. Yeah, because you don't see it anymore. I see plenty of people smoking weed, vaping. Uh, or vape. I was risers. fucking shocked to see someone smoking a regular old cigarette. Even it just in, doesn't make even sense. Even in uh, rehab, there was like everybody had a vape, but yeah. people didn't really have uh, yeah. it's great. You know, cigarettes. But you know, to that point, though, my brother and I, as we're making this documentary about you know obesity and diet, we we say 
that you know, hey, like we we hope that in the future people like remember when f- being fat was a thing. Yeah, yeah. Like it used to be like a thing. Smoking. smoking, you know, like yep. smoking. Yeah, like I, that's that's the days I'm waiting for because we know that we can get there. It's like, yeah. will we ever get there? Will, We've gone well, the other way, unfortunately. But yeah, but smoking. But let me describe what yeah. I mean by the years when people smoked. I mean, when I started practicing medicine. The you know the generation of the 30s and 40s were coming into their 70s and 80s, and they all had emphysema, they all had heart disease, they all had peripheral vascular disease. And when I would confront them about their cigarette smoking, <laughs> you would thought I like wanted to take a piece of their soul away from them. It was weird. Their self concept was so attached to I'm the cool smoker. Yeah. Even in their 70s, they could not. They, they'd start crying. Yeah, well, I would is, say this has got to go, and I'm it like, is pretty fucking. And you're like a young guy being like a, like a three, a dead, five year old right? bodybuilder. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's like, like don't smoke. They're like, they start crying. I was shocked. They're like, I went, I hate my doctor. <laughs> told me to stop smoking. I know there, yeah. there is a there is a weird thing about how you pointed out, Doctor Drew, that an endeavor for fitness doesn't necessarily have an effect on you medically. It 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 certainly doesn't hurt. Right. It might help, but it's a separate. Phenomenon. I'm saying it can hurt. And at, at elite well, yeah. level, at elite yeah. level fitness, yeah, well, if I, with listen, endurance running, and then with with powerlifting and strength. Well, training, let's be fair. Sometimes it, it can. And, it, and there, there's you know this the strong man syndrome, right? Yeah. What do they call it? Uh, it's not the Adonis syndrome. It's a there's like like Adonis complex. Well, there's an Adonis complex, which which is really sort of which we all have. Which we body all have, dysmorphia. Yeah. which is body dysmorphia <laughs> along with sort of a exercise bulimia. This is mm-hmm. where it goes mental health wise off the rack, right? So there's a medical issue where it can work against you, your hips, and then there's a psychiatric part to it too, where it's like mm, you have to balance all this. Yeah, because yeah. I, 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 I see these guys, you know, like Iron Man or ultra marathon runners, things like that. They're in, they're not doing too good medically. Yeah, and that and same with you know pro bodybuilders, pro pro professional competitive powerlifters, probably not doing too good. It's, it's you know right. there's it's not, something it's not... that there's a I don't know if the human body was necessarily designed for that. So well, we see it like with bodybuilding, like it's cool to a certain point, and then at what point does it break down? That's right. What that's point exactly does it go the question. The like, I say logical. about 1979. There's, well, there's a guy. <laughs> that's where it stopped being healthy. I'll give you a good example. Um, a guy like Rich Piana. Uh-huh. Rich Piana was huge. God rest he was like the soul. biggest bodybuilder yeah. that there, did that he there was. Just did just, yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he passed away, and I think it might have been um, opioids or whatever. Uh, um, but when you're that big, it was really cool. It was really cool to watch him, to follow him, yeah. to be like, he doesn't give a shit. Oh wait, then he died. Yeah. You know what I mean? You're like, yeah. this guy doesn't Listen, care. So oh, I told shit. super I, nice guy. We were talking oh, he was to great. a real nice he was guy. Great. He was a great inspiration to a lot of people, but yeah. we were talking about Dur- I used to work in Bill Pearl's gym in the 70s. Oh, you know, the, yeah. the Prince of Pasadena. Right, right. Mike knew it cuz yeah. he lived in Pasadena Bill too. Bill Pearl's the man. Yeah, Fuck he was yeah. he was but a lot of the guys that were under his tutelage back then dead quickly. Yeah. Dude, go, um, Chris funny and enough, I both I have a pretty funny story of uh, working out in Gold's gym. <laughs> One time um Mickey Rourke came up to me and was asking me about uh, steroids. Right. And he's asking me, like, hey, you know, blah, blah, does it, you know, this work, that work? And I'm like, why, you know, why ask me? Why don't you go ask this other trainer? He's trained everybody that's up on the wall here. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. all those guys on the wall are dead. Oh. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> I was like, that's like, that's you a good You go to Gold's Gym Venice, yeah. and it's a, it's a very sick game you play with the walls are covered with, like, is that person still alive yet? And we're talking about MPC champions from. 2001, but, but not 1950. Is, it's not specifically steroids. It's like everything that these guys do. Yeah, right. It's That's all right. the things that they do that you know go into. Uh, like I've had a couple people that have um, dehydration. They've had you know kidney transplants or liver yep. transplants. So for a while, the big thing was Nubane. Yeah, and there were people were taking Nubane like crazy, and then That's um, an opiate. Yeah, after the Nubane, they would get off of it, and they would take. Uh, Advil like crazy, and then they'd get a you know kidney transplant. Right? Oh, you know, Jesus. Well, so that's happened several God. times. If you bring up a good point, Chris, uh. and I want to know, even from your own personal experience <laughs> and then from what you see just being around the culture so much, there's also the mind frame of the same person who's going to fucking become a drug addict or is going to act out as a drug addict. It's kind of the same guy who wants to deadlift 650 pounds. It's not – there is a weird – kind of daredevil mentality that comes with someone who wants to be 280 and shredded and step on the Mr. Olympia stage to deadlift 700 pounds, whatever it may be, it, that those extreme yes, measures. Yes, and and there's a lot of crossover uh, getting high type biology from steroids that are right. similar to stimulants. Well, do, do you see that, especially, you know, it's, I guess, almost 10 years on the dot since Bigger, Stronger, Fat, right? Yeah, 10 years ago. When it yeah, debuted. Sundance was uh, 
what's going on now. So it's crazy. So they yeah, ten year right, oh, man, right on the ten year anniversary. Happy well, anniversary. fantastic. <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, you know that 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 documentary in particular did so much to shed some light on and give some real truth to what performance enhancing drugs are because it's there's this mythology of Mark McGuire and Lance Armstrong. People don't really know what the fuck they're talking about, but it gets talked about so much. But there is there is an addictive component. Sure. To seeing those types of, of gains, you know, that, that only come. I think it's addictive being like to uh, be great at something. To yeah. Be, to be good at something. Um, for me, growing up, I was short. I was short than everybody. I was never good at anything. And then when I lifted a weight, I remember the first time I bench pressed um, anything significant, I was going against my brother, my older brother, and I benched 275, and he was like, oh, shit. Without training? Well, this is this is after a little bit of training, yeah. but I I did it pretty young in like tenth grade, yeah. and then um, after a little bit more training, I'm like, wow, I benched three fifteen, uh. and my brother, my older brother, was t- starting to get nervous, and yeah. I knew at that point, okay, I'm good at this, and when I you know took that and ran with it, my younger brother, severely learning disabled, you know, uh, had all sorts of problems in school, but I got him lifting at twelve years old, and you know by the time he was sixteen years old, he was benching three fifteen. And now he's, you know, he's a multimillionaire and people are like, how did that, how did that happen? And it happened because he was so passionate about lifting weights and he made it, it just, he made it that one thing. He became the best, you know, in the world. And that, it, it shines that through in both you and your brother is that you're not, you're not just meatheads. You're just guys that have a really intense passion. We're definitely meatheads. <laughs> no, it, and, because, you know, there's, listen, meatheads plus. Listen, and, listen, yeah. there's plenty of guys who I, you know, I, I meant it in a non-derogatory way. No, no, sure. Because uh, you could include all three of us as being meatheads if you just say, hey, we like to lift weights and drink protein. Yeah. But what I mean by that is that there's, there's such a, uh, there's almost this rancid kind of world of the guys in the, in the, you know, the, the cutoff tank tops and the fucking neon and the, the old world idea of being a meat. You, your brother, uh, in his videos, really cuts to the, to the, like the bone, the center of problems for people who are trying to dissect the deadlift, trying to dissect the bench press, trying to di- dissect the conventional deadlift, as opposed to the, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, what you call it? The, Fucking ADL. narrow grip. What's, yeah. what's, 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 narrow grip? Sumo, sumo, oh, sumo stance. Oh, okay. The sumo stance deadlift. And and there, there's a, like a real interesting passion for it. And you can almost tell that like when you introduce it to your brother, he probably became one of those guys that was like obsessive. Like I see with guys with guitars. In the beginning, just, my younger brother was really resistant to lifting because huh. he was like, I don't want to do that. You know, that's, that's your thing, you know, kind of whatever. And then I think once he realized and he started realizing he got good at it, there was one particular day where he beat my cousin. He was only like 13 years old. And my cousin was my same age. And I remember he beat him in bench press. And then that was it. He was in. He just decided to take off, you know, from there. And he had, I remember him breaking records when we were teenagers. Um, I think the record for like the California state bench press champion was like 260 pounds. And Mark, huh. Mark went in at like 14 and did like 360. Oh my God. And people are like, what? Like, where'd this guy come from? And so then they bring him in the room and they're like testing him for steroids or giving, uh, <laughs> giving like a, you know, 15 year old kid or 14 year old kid a um, poly, polygraph test. Oh my God. Oh my God. You know, for steroids because that can't they be thought. psychologically healthy. Well, no, because they're like, well, you're the strongest one here. Yeah. We're like, yeah, different, know? different biologies, different c- we always We always got tested. My brother and I always got tested in all the meets back in the day because they knew that we were the teenage kids and we probably weren't on anything. Yeah. So they only test 10% of the lifters. So if they test the women and the teenagers, <laughs> they basically get away with like not testing anybody. So that's kind of like how it went for the most part. You know, back is, there, is there a certain level, though? I mean, there is so much of the mainstream media demonizes steroids as a whole. Mm-hmm. From an anti-aging standpoint, from a, just an overall health standpoint, and this question for you, Drew, and, and for Chris, there has to be some kind of wiggle room there, though, where a guy can be on 250 milligrams a week and, and, and improving his health medically. Uh, you know, two two fifty a test, maybe maybe GH every day. It's something and, something. And, and let me let me just not step crazy. back from and say we doing that with women for a long time, and they're still concerned about it, the breast cancer risk and that sort of thing. But we've done hormone replacements for women forever, uh, with varying degrees of success and enthusiasm. But it's back again, both testosterone and estrogen for women. Why shouldn't there be something like that for men? Right. And and I and I I, I listen. One thing I have seen, I will tell you what I've seen: have people have 
rapid cognitive deteriorations when we put them on testosterone blocking agents. So it makes sense to me there may be some neuroprotective qualities, right. some some some, uh, some aging related. You know who your telomeres yeah, you don't at, um, get as short as testosterone. Fast they used to use it for uh, well, they did a gigantic uh, study for um, to use it as a male birth control yeah. back in the day. Yeah. Uh, which I think every guy would be cool with. Like, okay, cool. I take some <laughs> yeah. testosterone. Fine, let's do it. Good. Yeah, and way um, better than a vasectomy. I just yeah. get jacked. And, and they <laughs> actually have done some pretty large scale studies where men have taken up to six hundred milligrams of testosterone a week. That's a lot. Um, showing no no detrimental side effects. Yeah, like, there's no. there's some concern about the vascular system with that level. Uh, but again, it's not like horrific. Yeah, uh, and we really still really don't know yet. So they're like up know. to six hundred milligrams, which is a lot. Like you know, you yeah, said wiggle wiggle room. We're talking about a dose normally being two hundred, so that's yeah. three times the normal allotted dose. Also, the other thing is that you could be on two hundred milligrams of exogenous testosterone and pass a drug test. So it all depends on because right. the, the drug test goes like how many. You know, how high is your testosterone level above your epitestosterone? Right. And there's so many ways to manipulate that that we don't know if people are really. And, and our range for normal is insanely big. You know, it's just 200 to 800 is, yeah. is the normal range for a male. How much of, of kind of the Hollywood scene is, if not directly using anabolic agent, androgenic agent, the clenbuterol, the GH, the ephedrine, the uh, you know, is I, the, I would say it's rampant. I mean, yeah. like I know all the people that train those people, and they're all taking it. So right. it's like, no, but <laughs> how, are, they, are any physicians participating in this? Any doctors? You know what? I, there's buff doctors, and by that I mean not buff like you're a doctor and you're buff. Yeah, I mean there's guys that are like they're physicians that cater to the world of athletes. Yeah, but some of them are like people that give out opiates too. I mean, they're very yeah. similar to that. They're drug dealers. I would say but, there's but some... But guys that are serious about it, there are very few, I would imagine. Yeah, I would say that like in the older, like in the population of guys like over 50 and yeah. stuff where they're not really so concerned about getting in trouble, you yeah. know, like a doctor prescribing testosterone to an older actor or something, not going to really get in trouble for that. I'm sure that goes on a lot. Like I have, I personally have a doctor that I know treats a lot of, a lot of people that are in movies and, and TV and stuff like that, um, very responsibly. You know, it's like he'll give you your 200 milligrams of testosterone and not much else. You know, with that, he's not prescribing Diana Ball or right. Anna, Anna Var. Yeah, but but still, I, we don't. Like that, we you know? I, I, he he's prescribing minimally. I don't know if he's prescribing responsibly. I don't know. I, I don't know either. Yeah. All I'm saying is I know what he prescribes yeah. me, and it's yeah. it's. I'd love to be on that shit. It's minimal. You know, I, like, I could. <laughs> what I. You know, you don't I don't you? understand. The producer doesn't I don't understand. Uh, oh, the voice of God coming. Yeah. No, you wouldn't. I would not like to be on testosterone. No, no you wouldn't I, like it if I were on testosterone. No, because Susan be walking I don't know. for the rest of her life. I, so I take testosterone. I'm on a 200, Amp up. 200 milligram dose. I, I'm, I'm admitting it. Come yeah. On. Yeah. Coming out with it. How old, how old, you, how old are you? Yeah. 45. Who gives a shit then? Well, you're a little young for that, but, you, but I, I would say, eh. Yeah. Don't you think that the two hip replacements and all the shit he's been My through hasn't affected his testosterone? What? The first time. Why? The first opiates. time they, that's the opiates. The first time they tested it. That was you were on drugs though. That yeah. Okay. Well, it does that. That plummets it. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. So, yeah. so I was I was pretty low. But um, yeah, but they do give testosterone replacements for people on opiates because it does really. Right now it's normal, you know, yeah. but it's still you know two hundred milligrams. That's kind of low. I don't. That's feel, low for your age. Mine's higher. Yeah. Really? Wow. Yes. God's is higher. That's, what, <laughs> My, that's why she looks that good. I don't. I don't feel that different being on it. Yeah, being off. Yeah, for sure. It's like I don't feel like massively like. Yeah, yeah. Well, I can totally tell that I'm on it, or if I'm not. Well, that's on it. the difference between well, when I a- was doing 750 milligrams a week, and and mixing it with Trent and and Deca, and you definitely feel when you're not on that. <laughs> How'd your face look? Uh, you know what? I never, never dealt with acne. Not in my life. I just, but you didn't mostly. get that. Um, oh yeah, blood? like a big fucking pumpkin. Yeah. <laughs> I look like uh, I look like Stallone after like one of his GH binges. I and are you on, are you doing anything now? No, no. You no, look I'm, great. Thank you. So what? why 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 were you doing that? You thought you needed to do it. Well, because I wanted to be I wanted to be superhuman. I yeah. didn't want to be. Oh, that, I think that guy lifts weights. I wanted to fucking turn into Bane. I had some weird, and I I just gotten sober, and so that was my. That was how I was going to fill that void. Is that I've I was going to completely lot, yeah. fucking in, um, devote myself and, and, into. And I would tell you that the the stimulant addict that uses steroids that doesn't cop to it, those guys die. 
Yeah, all the time. Because so he, he now he copped to it. He got straight about it. But but they just they just they hide it. You know, there's all this there's all this hiding about yeah. steroid use. I, and I think that that's that's a problem too. Is like it, you know the the people that do it. It is a very secret, which is behavior. so ridiculous. I remember um, it used to in be some really circles, secret. In some circles, well, Doctor Charles Yasalis actually went so far as to say. Other than uh, pedophilia, it's the most secretive behavior I've ever encountered. And he was sort of the guy that wrote the book on steroid behavior. Well, and, and I will tell you that it's not even just so much that they don't want to admit it or there's just some sort of stigma against it. They don't want to stop. And eventually mm-hmm. somebody's going to say, hey, man, that's not good for you. And they didn't want to get near that. They that was want, the reason it, why I didn't tell anybody about opioids. Was yeah. Like, I, you don't want to stop. Deep right. down, I yeah. didn't want to. I wanted to just keep cr- – I'm course. like, you know what? I know this is killing me. But if I tell somebody, then I got to stop doing yep. it, and it's yeah. That's it also, it also at at the point that you say it, you you're sort of admitting it to yourself too. Yeah. So there's two layers. One is you got somebody saying this is you're, this is deadly, and you've now let it in on your own. And I, I think it's smart that you bring that up because uh, with steroids, you know. If you're not mentally ready to take on that physical responsibility, yeah. that's where we get into those roid well, and rages I've been a, and those, oh, those yeah, things. I've been around it. Like I said, even because at Pearl's Gym and the Doug Brignoli's Gym. And I, I used Brignoli! To, I used to see Back these in guys. The day. I used to see these guys. And they used to kind of pull me aside. Can I get I'm like, whoa. Yeah. I, I, no, I can't do that. Yeah, but you get the human grade. Like, oh, you have people asking you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, yeah. Hey, bro. Well, cause, well cause also because you know, I've been in the gym since I was 15. We all kind of knew each other. And yeah. now, now I'm a resident in medicine. And they're you were the asking, go, you, you were the, they thought you were going to be thank, the go-to guy. Thank God I did not do never give anybody anything. Doctor Decca, sort of shocked. yeah, but you're, you can't. Doctor Decca drew because you can't get. You, <laughs> but I can see how. By the way, if I were taking it myself, it'd be a lot easier. Bar. Oh yeah, you yeah, know yeah, what yeah. I mean. <laughs> then you'd be like, yeah, it's good. I know it's good. Yeah, I'm taking right, it. Yeah. <laughs> when you're getting uh, veterinary grade shit, though, the idea of a physician getting you some human grade yeah, testosterone yeah. sounds fantastic. <laughs> you're, you're like, is that you're, what you're getting? Veterinary? Yeah, you're salivating right now. Have you been down to Mexico? Yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, I've been down to Mexico. I've been in the. Um, the stores where there's like live chickens clucking around yeah. and then you pull the um, testosterone off the shelf and there's like a bull on it. It says testosterone yep. 500. You're like, oh, this looks like it's good shit. <laughs> and you know, there's like, live farm stock animals around it. So why wouldn't it be safe to <laughs> inject it into my fucking body? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And that's it's good for these cows. And that's what you think because, you know, like, I don't know. I would, I would think. I get two bottles of that and some Novadex. Okay. So, yeah. so okay. Now, now we've gone all the way down the rabbit hole. Yeah. H- how do we express to people healthy we, we've discussed the difference between fitness and health. Right. We've discussed the sort of – the range of behaviors within Swole Patrol. Yeah. And, and we've now gone down the rabbit hole, which we don't want anybody to go down. No, don't go down the rabbit hole. And I've all, let, let me just say, I've also noticed even people that go down the rabbit hole, but just generally people that work out every day, have a remarkable resilience and an ability to sort of get shit done in life, mm-hmm. uh, even if they didn't go to school. They just something about going to a gym every day is a kind discipline. of a discipline. It's kind of a different kind of an experience that that just it's almost like meditation. It carries you almost like nothing else. Right. So, are we going to give any kind of pers- well? And let me and let me give this caveat. You don't want to know why? It, even in comparison to to really healthy endeavors like martial arts, like um, uh, studying uh, one of the arts, uh, yeah. painting, or yeah. there's there's always extraneous factors that can get in the way. With everything, my wife is an actress. She could be the most talented actress in the world if she doesn't get seen by the right people. If it, uh, there's so many factors that go into it. You uh, you could be really working hard at jujitsu. If you go up against a guy who grew up in fucking Brazil and has yeah. been, he's going to choke you to death. But if you, there's nothing in between you and, and the weights. weights. Yeah, and it's and almost you like know, you know if you yeah. come back. Three four days a week, and you incrementally increase. If you have just a, a just you you and keep feels good. That, that feels There's good. a direct yeah. response to it, and it, it's it's very clean. But, but it's it's also but to the to the argument you're making, it's it's meditative. I really yeah. believe it's a meditative absolutely uh, for if, for some people more than others. For me, profoundly. I think um, for me, getting in, into the gym every day in the morning, that's what sort of starts my day. It gets my mind going. Um, yesterday, I'll give you a great example. I had to go in. I knew I had to deadlift yesterday, and I have two fake hips. So I'm thinking, okay, 315 pounds for three sets of five reps. I'm going to go in. I'm going to do that. After the first set, it was so hard. Yeah. But I'm like, I'm. I don't care how hard this is. Well, I'm going to stick it out, and I'm going to get through these. I got through them, and I yeah. felt so good. Yeah, after, there is another. Know? Corolla and I talk about this all the time. There is something about 
creating adversity on a regular basis. So yeah, the, it was the cre- Navy, totally creative. Yeah, Native, creative. Sea, Native Seal, Navy Seal guys, Seal guys talk about this. A lot of guys that succeed in various ways talk about. You know, Coral and I have started taking cold showers every day just yeah. just to just to give us something adverse to go through. Together, we, yeah, we could, together. Yeah. we could. But that we have to do every day that we hate that we do it just just to do it. Just yeah. because Doctor gotta- Drew's cock in the cold shower still twice as big as mine. That's you know, crazy. Even when he shrivels up in the cold shower, it's amazing. When I go inside out, how, it's do, about you, the how same. do you do it? All right, whoa, Mike, whoa, whoa, whoa. our producer's the voice yelling. Of God is getting. Yeah. Oh, we got to take a break. I thought you were saying wrap it up. All right, we're going to take a break. Our guest, Chris Borbell, filmmaker, strength trainer, all around great guy. Uh, we'll take a quick break. Be right back. Ah. <laughs> Okay, we're back, and then Mike. Uh, but I wanted us yes. to get to so, some sort of a pro- prescriptive sort of position for the three of us, for what we would recommend for the average person. And it's well, different in different ages. By yeah, the way. I, I'm glad you put it that way. I, that's all I wanted to do was have Chris's opinion and Drew your opinion. The biggest fallacies that are being spread in yeah. the fitness world, and then also what you what is the best and, like, and to be fair, advice. This was a survey. We were sort of you know touching sure, on yeah. everything. I, I, my thing is. First of all, the diet and the exercise you will do is the one you should do. You, you know what I mean? Yeah. If you don't like it, you ain't going to do it. I don't care which what it is. They're, they're, your motivational system well, will Well, I don't want to say like it. You don't have it. to love if it. If you can't adhere to it. You, if you, if you really hate it, yeah. yeah, then it's not going to It's hard work. to tell somebody like me or you to go do yoga if you're not going to do it. I can't stand it. Yeah, yeah, yeah I can't stand like it. If you don't like it. And by the way, I have had patients and stuff who really – they actually are miserable when I feel so lucky that I'm not that when they exercise. They literally feel extreme misery with even modest amounts of exercise, and I feel very sad for people like that because there's almost no way yeah. to get them. I to, don't understand how I don't either. Can't grab a barbell and be like, I, oh. I know, I don't either. But they're out there. Believe me, I've seen them. So for those people, I mean, walk, <laughs> yeah, whatever, do something, move. You know, move. walking has been my savior for losing weight. Um, my brother and I started this thing called the Ten Minute Walk. It's really easy. It's a hashtag, hashtag Ten Minute Walk. And what we do, we just encourage everybody that we know, everybody, yeah. including our parents who do it all the time now. Every time you eat a meal, you take a ten minute walk. It's been shown to wow. increase. Di- your, we've been telling diabetics that forever. Yeah, it's, it's been shown to increase your metabolism, insulin resistance, increase yeah. insulin, insulin, insulin yeah. Yeah. Re- resistance, yeah. all these things. So yeah. it's the easiest thing I've ever ever done so, so move walk and it I, works and, and by the way i would add to the tortoise said this to me too i think he's right after about the age of 55 or so running is pretty important mm-hmm. See, I, I do very low intensity very slow running and it makes a difference yeah it, it makes everything else sort of possible as long as you don't kick so. it into the glycolytic level you know staying well, once it's um, a low grade stress CPM, low grade yeah. stress yeah. we recover from yeah, yeah. and we seem to do better after them you yeah know? real low grade and, and uh so that's important, uh, but I just think resistance training is key at all ages. Everybody, uh, yeah. yeah, I think another good key thing, and all, and by the way, both genders, absolutely. And so many women are so, like just they they look at 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 weight training as just this. Well, they have, they, have the, they also have this very bizarre statement that everybody says, which is, I don't want to get too big, yeah. and, which is the most bizarre statement. As ever. if you're going to yeah, magically yeah, ahead, do yeah, something ahead, bro. that <laughs> every gonna fucking body is going to get too huge. Yes. Yeah. You, yes. People on, on just, just tons of anabolic steroids yeah. and to train for a living, yeah, they can gain... 10 pounds in a year if they're well, fucking it's that lucky. story where somebody's like looking at Arnold going, I don't want to look like that. Yeah, He's yeah. like, don't worry, you never will. Yeah, you won't. You know? Don't yeah. worry, you won't. Arnold doesn't look like that anymore. No, but he also, still looks decent though. He does He's still good. got pretty yeah. big pipes. I see him in golds. Yeah. He works out of Mike, golds every day. I see him all the time. And yeah. I, I always talk to Drew about how it's a very strange thing and we'll never see it again. A worldwide, massive, A-plus level celebrity who just talks to people, like, yeah, just, just walk. walks around. Yeah, but, but tell him what he tells you. Oh, yeah. My, Do your Arnold. My father um, is really, really uh, dedicated to the Special Olympics and has mm-hmm. been for a long time. And uh, he subsequently got me into it. So every year they have a, a couple big, big galas in Southern California. And up until the incident with his housekeeper, uh, Arnold would show up with Maria Shriver, who, you know, everyone knows the Shriver family has pretty much founded the Special Olympics. So they'd show up, and Maria and Arnold would show up, and every year, every year without fail, my dad would be like, let's go, let's go talk to Arnold. <laughs> so my dad bring me up, and he'd be like, Mr. Schwarzenegger, um, this is my son, and, and to, verbatim, every year it's the same fucking thing. <laughs> this is my son, Michael, and, I, and he goes, oh, yes, yes, and I go, and I go shake his hand, and my dad will say, 
he's actually really into. And before he can complete his sentence, Arnold goes, oh, no, I can tell. It's beautiful deltoids. It's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. yeah yes, you know, look at your pecs. It's great. It's fantastic. Every, he loves to give, uh, he, he every loves to give compliments. Yeah. You know, don't listen to you. In that, he won't in that. even let my dad finish the he loves bodybuilding. He gets into, <laughs> Do you in remember? The, um, in, in the Born Strong thing, he loves to, oh, so great. These guys are so well, strong. I love seeing them. Um, in Bigger, Stronger, Faster, yeah. I meet him on his campaign trail. Oh, wow. And I lock arms with him. And the only thing he says is, look at them arms. Look at those arms. <laughs> and he's talking to me. It's like his arms are way bigger How than mine. How is Tom Arnold his best friend? How's, uh, how's what do you mean? How is that not that? perfect? It's perfect. <laughs> it's per. Oh, I'm. I uh, my dick almost exploded like a sausage. You leave in the microwave too long. Why? The other day, I'm at the. I'm at. I'm at. <laughs> okay. I'm at. Uh, this is the 16 percent he talked about at the yeah, beginning. No, no, no. We've done enough swole patrol. No, now no, the 16 no. percent. I have happen. the best swole patrol story of all swole yeah, patrol all stories. Right. I. It was like if 12 year old Mike saw this, <clears> his head would blow right off his fucking neck. I was at the gym at Golds in Venice. Uh, and I'm working out. This is a uh, weekend. I don't know. Saturday, Sunday. But it was a weekend. And it's middle of the day. Arnold shows up. And I'm used to seeing him in the morning. But he, he shows up and he has the same crew. And they ride their bikes up. And he's like, oh, hello, everybody. It's great. <laughs> and, we're, and all of a sudden, I see like a commotion at the front uh, desk. Maybe 20 minutes into my workout. And I see Fucking Frank Sloan walks in. He's always there. Oh, yeah. Frank Frank's Sloan's there. He's always, always there. Yeah. Sly walks in behind him. Oh, yeah. oh really? When was this? Maybe three weeks ago. Oh, jeez. I, I know. It. So I'm going, wait a second. Sly Stallone just walked in. Arnold's working out. The fucking meeting, gonna mind, happen. meeting of the minds is going to happen. Do they and like I'm, each other? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, it, but, I mean, that's, the, that's yeah, it. That's yeah. Rambo well, man, and the Terminator. Right. No, and the same. I, I, yeah. So I'm, like, just watching. I'm, like, I walk away from the squad rack. I'm just, like, watching, watching. Sure enough, they lock eyes. Ah, the, uh, uh, uh. And they just walk <laughs> towards each other. And they fucking do the, the, the buff guy handshake. Yes, like, yes. And I'm, like, oh, this is everything I ever dreamed of. Look at him. Look at him. And they were just in their own buff guy, old man, oh, growth hormone world. I know. Growth hormone world. Yeah, we'll talk about that at a later date. I've to decide if if you if you got a guy in here that will put me on growth hormone, I'll consider it. I told you, I got the guy. Right, I Tomorrow you can't be go on. to him. I can't go to him. Why? He's, he's out by the airport. It's too far from me. You work in Culver City. Uh, I got plenty of guys will come to you and sell you. Growth see? Hormone. <laughs> <laughs> see, he doesn't want it sold. Legal. He just wants that prescription. That's all he <laughs> yeah. wants. No, I want somebody to tell me how to do that in a healthy way. I don't it's, know that human growth hormone does anything. I don't know if it does like, anything in the absence so, of my, testosterone. I yeah, think that com- coupled. I think coupled, it by does great by blend. itself. I don't know. I don't know. Does it strengthen it's... soft tissue, tendons? Maybe a little bit, but I, I haven't seen that right. much proof. Like where people have been using it with, you know, it used to be 15 years ago. Everybody's raving about it, but it just. Seems I, like well, now, no, I think the the, really the injury it. prevention, oh, the anti-inflammatory right. effects are are possibly the step. Yeah. meaning that if you take a six year old guy who's got a bum neck from lifting weights and boxing, I was like, for him to take it, you get you would be a it different gets you a little. Reason, I think yeah. that, that I, I got a might, shoulder. I got yeah, a shoulder it may thing. be good. But have you looked in the stem cells for that? It would be great. It would be Have great. you listened I, I, to um, Joe Rogan's recent episode with Mel Gibson on it? I saw that, that Mel was in there. Okay, I did so not. that episode is awesome. Yeah. I, I, I am Joe with Glum Cunt. I saw that. Said, I'm going to bury you in the I fucking am, Rose Garden. I am well, a, Mel Gibson I am barely a, says anything. It's mostly the doctor talking. No, but the, 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 the platelets and whatnot clearly work. Clearly yeah. it's a good thing. And uh, so I, I was almost – I was going on that path at one point. And what that would let me do again is lift very heavy weights again. Sure. Yeah, it's limited my weightlifting. I, I'm not a gearhead like these guys in the Gold's Gym. I work out in my garage. That's my – Yeah, meditation. but you, that's all you need. have a pretty good gym in your garage. How much, how much barbell weight do you have? How much plate weight? I don't use it anymore. I don't use barbells anymore at all. Maybe, maybe some squats, but that's about it. Okay. But I, but I down there, how much does – my sons use it, so there's yeah. a bunch of weight down there. But you're in great shape. Would you ten percent body fat? Oh, I have no idea. But dumb, we could have dumbbells, Drew, dumbbells, you could be thing. deadlifting five hundred pounds in a year. I, I, I low back and neck, man, it's bad. bad, bad but bad. that'll help it. Uh, How old are you? Fifty nine. Wow. So, See, he looks great, man. I saw you hitting some big numbers recently. Like you're um, back going back at it. A little bit. You know, yeah. I have two fake hips, so I can't go too at it. My brother just had a uh, powerlifting meet up north called the Super Training Classic, and so I I went in that just for fun. I just deadlifted four hundred pounds. Still, for a f- mid guy in his mid forties, that's better than ninety nine percent of but anyone me, that's ever walked the face of the earth. To me, it's terrible. I understand but. you bet. <laughs> you ever broke six? Yeah, I've done six. Uh, right, right around that is my best deadlift. My bench used to be my my good thing. You know, my, I used to bench over five all the time. Oh my god! Now that the sho- my shoulder is shot like Drew's. Um, I'm looking into the stem cells and some other things to try to fix that, but it's been, you know, what happened? Um, I 
So when I was doing drugs, I tore my tricep. And since I didn't care, for three years, I just let my tricep hang because I was doing drugs and drinking every day. Didn't really ever get it fixed or healed. Mm. When I went to rehab was when I started lifting again. Uh. And as soon as I started lifting, like any sort of pressure on my shoulder, I then tore my rotator cuff. Oh! Because the tricep couldn't support it. So I had a torn rotator cuff, torn tricep. I'm just kind of recovering from all that. But, you know, I have to say that, like, everything actually feels pretty good coming back. It's just going to take a while. Drew uh, often rips connective tissue in his pelvis from just all the torque. Yeah. Uh, uh, Driving it home. Driving it home. Powering it home. I've never talked about swole patrol type issues this long in a single sitting in my life <laughs> it's, it's it's enjoyable it isn't is it? it is there's something about it that is like nothing else uh, at at big strong fast on twitter and instagram is there any uh website anywhere else people can go i think that's all they need you want to pimp out uh the slingshot too though it's a yeah, great yeah, yeah how much you bench.net is my brother's uh website so www dot how much you bench.net is where you can get the slingshot and all the related slingshot products as well all right man Chris also. Bell, it's always a pleasure wait, to talk wait. to you. Wait, wait. Also. Oh, producer, what? Oh, yes. The voice of God. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. I like that. We have at Swole Patrol Pod on Twitter. Nice. Drew, we got our own Twitter. We go. got our own Twitter feed now. And wow. at Swole Patrol Podcast on Facebook. Okay. okay. There wow. you go. There you go. Hey, we're real. Now, now we know. For real. <laughs> that makes everything legit. I want Susan to talk in the reverb voice forever. It freaks it's, 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 <laughs> I don't like it so much. sounds fantastic. I don't dig it. Yeah. We need some sort of um, a... You know, aloha, mahalo sort of greeting for the end of our program. She'd be like, <laughs> Go to, no, it should be that Arnold, like, uh, Arnold Stallone meeting. How's it? Ah, that's great. No, it's like, it's like, yeah, we need a hashtag. We need a hashtag. Swole Patrol, right? Nat King Swole. <laughs> <laughs> I th- it's making people can't laugh. it just be Swole Patrol. Yeah, I, I, I think if we can get it, get hashtag Swole. Patrol. Join the Swole Patrol. Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. yeah honestly, honestly right. thank you. All right. It's always yeah, a pleasure really to talk fun. To you. Absolutely. Really great a pleasure. Talking to you as well. Thanks for listening to Swole Patrol with Mike Catherwood and with myself, Dr. Drew Pinsky. You can follow us at Swole Patrol Pod, S W O L E Patrol Pod, on Twitter and at Swole Patrol Podcast on Facebook. Subscribe to the show on iTunes or wherever you get your favorite podcast. And do not forget to head over to drdrew.com to find all the Playroom Pod shows. While you're there, please click through the links to support our sponsors. Supporting them helps us do these shows. So thanks again.